Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church, live on a Wednesday night. The house is all full. I am ready to open up the book for you guys. Just a couple of quick announcements, really quick, in case some of you slipped in or you just tuned in on the internet. Uh, we're glad you guys are here. Uh, my wife's Bible study, Cindy's Bible study, has only had one week, so that's tomorrow. And so if you haven't jumped in on that, uh, Cindy's right back there. If you want to tackle her after the service and say, I want to come, she'll let you. And uh, so that's tomorrow. Sunday, we're having baptisms. And so we haven't had baptisms like in six months, at least in the room. So we're going to do that in this room, second service Sunday. If you have not followed Jesus in water baptism, let me say it this way. If you have not followed Jesus in water baptism... Maybe you got baptized for a church or a parent or a Sunday school. What? No, no, no. When did you follow Jesus in water baptism? If you want to do that Sunday, Scott Davies back there. The lights are still off. So anyway, Scott, you can get a hold of Scott or call the church, leave a note in an offering box. We'd love to have you get baptized this Sunday. Amen? I know the lights are down, but can I have Chuck and Carla top? Stand up for a second. See these guys right in the middle? Missionaries to Mexico for like the last 97 years. They've been down there for like ever. And way back in the day, 30-some years ago, Carla came to our church, and then she met Chuck, and her life went down the tubes. But anyways, they are lifelong missionaries in our church, and uh, we're glad they're here tonight. Okay, just to bring you up to speed, we're going through the Bible book by book and we're using the Bible Project as a foundation, okay? And so tonight we're going to show this video for the third time, but we're going to finish chapters 1 through 11. Believe it or not, I'm going to finish <laughs> chapters 1 through 11 today. So I'm glad you're here. And just to bring us up to speed, to remind some of us, some of you it's new, the Bible Project, Genesis 1 through 11. The book of Genesis. It's the first book of the Bible, and its storyline divides into two main parts. There's chapters 1 through 11, which tell the story of God and the whole world. And then there's chapters 12 through 50, which zoom in and tell the story of God and just one man, Abraham, and then his family. And these two parts are connected by a hinge story at the beginning of chapter 12. And this design, it gives us a clue to how to understand the message of the book as a whole and how it introduces the story of the whole Bible. So the book begins with God taking the disorder and the darkness described in the second sentence of the Bible, and God brings out of it order and beauty and goodness. He makes a world where life can flourish. And God makes these creatures called humans, or Adam in Hebrew. He makes them in his image, which has to do with their role and purpose in God's world. So the humans are made to be reflections of God's character out into the world, and they're appointed as God's representatives to rule his world on his behalf, which in context means to harness all of its potential, to care for it, and make it a place where even more life can flourish. God blesses the humans. It's a key word in this book. And he gives them a garden. It's like a place from which they begin starting to build this new world. Now, the key is that the humans have a choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And that's represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Up till now, God has provided and defined what is good and what is not good. But now God is giving the humans the dignity and the freedom of a choice. Are they going to trust God's definition of good and evil, or are they going to seize autonomy and define good and evil for themselves? And the stakes are really high. To rebel against God is to embrace death, because you're turning away from the giver of life himself. This is represented by the tree of life. And so in chapter 3, a, a mysterious figure, a snake, enters into the story. The snake's given no introduction other than it's a creature that God made. And it becomes clear that it's a creature in rebellion against God, and it wants to lead the humans into rebellion and their death. The snake tells a different story about the tree and the choice. It says that seizing the knowledge of good and evil are not going to bring death, that it's actually the way to life and becoming like God themselves. Now, the irony of this is tragic because we know the humans, they're already like God. They were made to reflect God's image. But instead of trusting God, the humans seize autonomy. They take the knowledge of good and evil for themselves, and in an instant, the whole story spirals out of control. 
The first casualty is human relationships. The man and the woman, they suddenly realize how vulnerable they are. Now, they can't even trust each other. And so they make clothes and they hide their bodies from one another. The second casualty is that intimacy between God and the humans is lost. So they go and run and hide from God, and then when God finds them, they start this game of blame shifting about who rebelled first. Now right here the story stops, and there's a series of short poems where God declares to the snake and then to the humans the tragic consequences of their actions. God first tells the snake that despite its apparent victory, it is destined for defeat to eat dust. God promises that one day a seed or a descendant will come from the woman who's going to deliver a lethal strike to the snake's head, which sounds like great news, but this victory is going to come with a cost because the snake too will deliver a lethal strike to the descendant's heel as it's being crushed a very mysterious promise of this wounded victor. But in the flow of the story so far, you see this is an act of God's grace. The humans, they've just rebelled. And what does God do? He promises to rescue them. But this doesn't erase the consequences of the human's decision. So God informs them that now every aspect of their life together at home and out in the field, it's going to be fraught with grief and pain because of the rebellion, all leading to their death. From here, the story then spirals downward. Chapters 3 through 11, they trace the widening ripple effect of the rebellion and of human relationships fracturing at every level. So there's a story about two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain's so jealous of his brother that he wants to murder him. And God warns him not to give in to the temptation, but he does anyway. He murders him in the field. So Cain then goes on to build a city where violence and oppression reign. And this is all epitomized in the story of Lamech. He's the first man in the Bible to have more than one wife. He's accumulating them like property. And then he goes on to sing a short song about how he's more violent and vengeful than Cain ever was. After this, we get an odd story about the sons of God, which could refer to evil angelic beings, or it could refer to ancient kings who claimed that they descended from the gods. And like Lamech, they acquire as many wives as they wanted, and they produce the Nephilim, these great warriors of old. Whichever view is right, the point is that humans are building kingdoms that fill God's world with violence and even more corruption. In response, we're told that God is broken with grief. Humanity is ruining his good world, and they're ruining each other. And so out of a passion to protect the goodness of his world, he washes it clean of humanity's evil with a great flood. But he protects one blameless human, Noah, and his family, and he commissions him as a new Adam. He repeats the divine blessing and commissions him to go out into the world. And so our hopes are really high, but then Noah fails too, and also in a garden. He goes and he plants a vineyard, and he gets drunk out of his mind. And then one of his sons, Ham, does something shameful to his father in the tent. And so here we have our new Adam, naked and ashamed just like the first, and the downward spiral begins again. It all leads to the foundation of the city of Babylon. The people of ancient Mesopotamia, they come together around this new technology they have, the brick. And they can make cities and towers bigger and faster than anybody's ever done before. And they want to build a new kind of tower that will reach up to the gods, and they will make a great name for themselves. It's an image of human rebellion and arrogance. It's the garden rebellion now writ large. And so God humbles their pride and scatters them. Now, this is a diverse group of stories, but you can see they're all exploring the same basic point. God keeps giving humans the chance to do the right thing with his world, and humans keep ruining it. These stories are making a claim that we live in a good world that we have turned bad, that we've all chosen to define good and evil for ourselves, and so we all contribute to this world of broken relationships leading to conflict and violence and ultimately death. But there's hope. God promised that one day a descendant would come, the wounded victor who will defeat evil at its source. And so despite humanity's evil, God is determined to bless and rescue his world. And so the big question, of course, is what is God going to do? And the next story, The Hinge, offers the answer. But for now, that's what Genesis 1 through 11 is all about. Amen.
Take your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11 tonight. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. I'm about to uh, perform a miracle if you're Pastor Bill. And uh, I have to preach in one sermon a third of human history and cover Genesis chapter 4 through 11. So this service is going to go on for six hours. (laughs) Or I'm going to talk really, really fast. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Are you guys there? Okay. I know the lights are coming on, but pay attention to your Bibles. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance, it's the realization of things hoped for, the evidence, the confidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Now, if you don't know anything about the Bible, if you don't know anything, right there is in verse 2, you would want to be one of the elders, you'd want to be one of the people that obtain a good testimony because of faith. Hebrews 11 is what we call the the hall of faith. You take the people in the Old Testament, and so the writer of Hebrews is going back, and he's pulling out some people from the Old Testament, and if there's a chapter you would want to be in, it would be this one. Amen? So you'd have to be a man or a woman of faith. But now wait, wait, what does it mean to be a man or woman of faith? Well, the definition right there in verse 1, faith is the substance It's the realization of things hoped for. It's the evidence or the confidence of things not seen. If I said it this way, physically, you see things with your eye. And so when you see things with your eye, you can understand pretty much what you're looking at. I really believe the chair is there because I see it with my eye. I don't know for sure, but then I go over and say, yeah, the chair's really there. My eye is doing that physical thing that I know that faith is the eye that sees things spiritually. You you see things with the eye of faith. Now, where we get confused sometimes, we think, well, you mean you're just going to believe it? No, no. We're not going to throw reason away. Reason's important, but faith is different than reason. It's like if I came to you and said, you know, this Bible is the most produced, longest, bestseller of all books ever, and you would all go, amen. I can prove that statistically. That would be reason. This is the number one book, period. Can I hear an amen? Oh, but if I come back and say, not only do I believe that with reason, but by faith, I believe it's the Word of God. So I'm not throwing reason away, but then comes in this, I'm looking at this because I really believe the evidence, confidence, it's substantial. This is the Word of God. Now, can I prove that to some scientists over at Amarillo College? No. I make an argument, but I can't prove it. My eyeball of faith, I know it's the Word of God. See, faith works that way. And So men and women of faith, we don't just look at history. We just don't look at the Word of God. We We can see things spiritually by faith. The world doesn't get it, but we do. By the way, if you're not a man or woman of faith, I pray tonight that the Holy Spirit speaks to you, that Jesus knocks on the door of your heart, that you'll finally believe Him by faith, and then, whoa, you'll be in this family that it'll change and rock your heart world. Amen? And that's what the elders of old, for by it, for by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. See, I want that. You want that. And then he's going to start listing some guys in the Old Testament that go down with a great testimony by faith. Father, I pray as we open your word that we would be men and women of faith, not foolishness, Not a a blind faith, but a faith that can see what you have given to us, a faith that can receive the Holy Spirit, a faith that really does believe, a faith that obeys, a faith that follows the person of Jesus Christ. 
All of those things, Lord. And I thank you that even these ones tonight on a Wednesday being here, it demonstrates their faith. I pray, Lord, that my faith would grow. That when my life is over, I might have a good testimony of what I have believed, what I have done with my life, the choices I have made because of faith. We thank you for sending your son, Lord Jesus, that you came and all the problems we see in the Old Testament because of bad choices over and over again, Lord Jesus, you made up for all of them. And then all the problems we have created in our own lives with bad choices, that by faith in you, Lord Jesus, not only have you made up for them, you've made us sons and daughters of righteousness all by faith. And as we live in an upside-down world, I pray, Lord, I don't expect the world to be a world of faith. But as your believers, Lord, children of Jesus Christ, children of God the Father, I pray we might be people of faith with a good testimony when everything around us has fallen apart. That's my prayer. We welcome you tonight, Lord Jesus, to this place. I thank you for the guys that are online and on radio, Lord. I thank you for visitors in the room. Thank you for Chuck and Carla's faithfulness to you in Mexico all these years. But now, right now, that you would send the Holy Spirit, Lord, to fill all of us, that we might see some things that we need to do by faith as we follow Jesus. That's my prayer, and that the Lord Jesus would receive all of the honor, all of the glory, and God's people would say... So, if you're tracking with me, we want to be men and women of faith. We want to follow the Lord Jesus. And these guys in the Old Testament, they had a good testimony that did that. The number one guy listed right here, verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. By faith he did that. He offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. While the first guy that's listed in the hall of faith is Abel, and what he did was so faithful God would brag about it thousands of years after he died. Before you say, well, hey, where did it get him? He just got killed by his brother. No, 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 no. He's the one, and God is still bragging. God is still testifying what Abel did by faith. Can I hear an amen for faith? See, what, what you don't know, your acts of faith, your obedience by faith, when you listen to God, even when it doesn't make sense, goes on into eternity. Do you see that? You say, well, where'd that story come from? I'm glad you asked, because that's where we left off in the book of Genesis. Uh, That's one thing I want to show you, how Genesis, how the Old Testament ties into the New Testament. You can't understand the new without the old. You can't understand the old without the new. It's all one book about Jesus, in case you're wondering. The whole book's about Jesus. So going way, way back to the beginning, we get to chapter 4. We went through chapters 1, 2, and 3. Hang on. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Adam knew wife his, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. The name Cain actually means acquire. And so, like, you know, a lot of times when we have our first child with you, woohoo! What a blessing, what a blessing. Then you find out, well, it's not a blessing after all. You say, what do you mean it's not a blessing after all? Well, she actually thought, I think because she acquired the man from the Lord, Eve actually thought that's what was promised in chapter 2. Or chapter 3, excuse me. She thought, okay, the promise one is here. So let's just call him Cain, acquired one. Yes. No. Cain had a sin nature. Cain was grew up, you know, Cain was a problem. And then she, her, her hopes were dashed. You mean my son's not perfect? No, because Jesus is the seed of the woman, and Cain came from the seed of Adam, okay? So he gets the sin nature right off the bat. You say, well, when did they figure that out? Probably when he was about four months old. 
And that's when they start biting and looking at you. And then for sure you know by the time they're nine months old, you're not the perfect angel I thought you were. And you say, well, Pastor Bill, you're stretching it. No, I'm not stretching it. Look at what it says. I've acquired a man from the Lord. I can see her smiling and all this stuff. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Uh, the name Abel means vanity, empty, nothing. The reality of the human race that now the wages of sin is death. And when do you start seeing the sin? Well, the marriage and the fights and then the kids and then the fights and then all this stuff and before you know it, it's a mess. But after a good talking to, going to the right Christian school, they're going to grow up and be fine. No. No. The first family. The first bros. The first story. She bore at this time another, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a farmer a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, you know, they got to grow up and be teenagers, probably somewhere around 20. I don't know. We don't know their age. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit, of the fruit of the ground, to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. Remember last week we talked about there was still access at least to the cherubim guarding the tree of life. There was still a way to worship the Lord. Somehow communicated to the boys, the brothers, by God that you can bring your offering. Now see what we already know because of Hebrews. I kind of cheated and told you ahead of time. Guess what? Abel's offering is by faith. Cain's offering is by religion, by mom and dad telling him, by I really don't want to do this, but I'll do it anyways. Cain is going through the motions. Abel's heart by faith is being obedient. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? Now, if you're only stuck with Genesis, well, then you have to say, well, what, why did this happen? But we're not stuck with just Genesis. We get to go back to Hebrews. That's why I love. I can say dogmatically, Abel is a man of faith. Cain is not. I want to be one like Abel, that whether it's my offering, whether it's coming to church, whether it's reading my Bible, I want to do it with a freshness. I want to do it by faith to please the Lord, not to go through the motions or check off a box. No, no, Lord, make me a man of faith like Abel. And you say, where will that get you? Killed. And that's going to get everybody mad at you. So it gets him in the Hall of uh, Records, in uh, the Hall of Faith in chapter 11. But we already know. So he, Cain just brings this offering of the fruit of the ground. Nothing special about that. He just brought it. But Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. It seems like there's an extra there. And I know there's a whole argument about the fruit of the ground or, you know, the killing of livestock. But I just, I know dogmatically Abel did it by faith. Cain did it by the flesh. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. So Cain repented and said, what must I do, Lord, to be like my brother? just lied to you. That's not what he said. You ever seen two brothers that get in a fight? Because one gets blessed and the other doesn't. So the one that doesn't get blessed, instead of saying, hey, we get to make choices. God told us what to do. And the right response would be, I need to make better choices by faith. But the fleshly result or the fleshly response is, I'm just going to get jealous. I'm going to get bitter. I'm going to get depressed. Cain was very angry. His countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen?
fallen. First depression in mankind's history right there. Why? Jealousy, bitterness, I can't please God. And all of a sudden, there you are on the bottom. So he made an appointment with his doctor, and he went and got some pills, and he took his pills. And <laughs> uh, there is a place for doctors. And sometimes there's even a place for medication. But I'm here to tell you, most of the time, you're sulking, you're well, you could say the word depression, your discouragement. You're like, I should have a broken left. You reap what you sow. And the good part about being a man or woman of faith is that you can recognize that. And what Cain actually should have done was like, go back and tell me again what you expect with an offering, Right? What Cain should have done is said, okay, Lord, I really want to be, you know, spirit-filled on top of everything, so tell me, how can I fix this? That's what Cain, but he doesn't do that. So God shows up and he says, hey, how come you're so down in the dumps? Why is your countenance falling? You're moping around. And then God said this. God said this personally to Cain. If you do well, will not your, will not your be accepted? Will not... Will you not be accepted, excuse me, if you do well? In other words, you get to make choices. So don't compare yourself. Hey, Cain, just do better. If you do well by faith like your brother did, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And sin's desire, its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. That's God talking to Cain. Cain, you're all down in the dumps. Hey, you know what? If you'll just do better, if you'll be a man of faith, if you'll listen to me, it'll be great. But if you don't, it's like sin's over here. You want to be lifted up or you want to be eaten up? It's like sin is personified there. It's just right at the door. By the way, don't go to the door. You can't beat it. You can't beat it. And God is counseling him. Hey, let's, let's do a do-over. Aren't you glad God is a God of do-overs? It's like, I've got a second chance. And that's actually, this is at the very beginning of our Bibles. And wouldn't it be great if Cain would have said, I, I repent, I need Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit. There's not much of a Bible yet, but help me to understand it. I'll go and repent to you, Lord, and make up with my brother because I've been giving him dirty looks for like three days now. And, you know, and mom's all worried and she's in her prayer closet. Okay, you're right, God, you're right. But that's not what the natural man does. You know the story. Now Cain talked with his brother, Abel his brother. It came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. I cannot imagine how Adam felt how Eve felt. I can't imagine how God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit felt. I don't know about you, but I get really ticked off when I see people killing people, even watching the news. I don't know about you, but I get really mad. And then it gets really personal. What's the lesson? Abel did not die in vain. Abel died because he did everything right by faith. And Jesus Christ, who, by the way, God doesn't need faith. You understand that, right? God is perfect and was killed for you and me so that we could be men and women of faith. Amen? What happened so far in Genesis? A great man of faith. And then we see the consequences of sin. So I'm going to jump ahead to chapter 5. And what's the point so far? Be a man or woman of faith. If you need to go to God and repent and say, God, just show me what to do. We all get to make choices. And we do reap what we sow. Amen. God gives us a chance to make the right choices. Chapter 5, though, we see something 
all of a sudden for the first time in uh, verse 5. So all the days of Adam, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Can I hear you say died? Verse 8, so all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Can I hear you say died? Uh, verse 11, so all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Can I hear you say died? In case you're saying, were those real years? Those were real years. Another sermon, go back and check it out when I had more time just to preach that. Verse 14, so all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. Can I hear you say died? I don't know if you catch the theme here, but when you come through the fall and then all of a sudden people are dying, so Abel's the first one to die, but now all of these others are catching up Death is the result. The wages of sin is death. Verse 17, so all the days of Mahaliel were 895 years, and he, what's the word? And then we come to verse 20. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he, what happened? That's the way it is. No way around it. Until you get to Enoch. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, wait, 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 wait. We're just reading through our Bible. I'm trying to give you the whole context, and all of a sudden you get to this guy named Enoch. And it says that Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Um, it's interesting. I turned 65 on Monday. Hey, Cindy. <laughs> Anyways, if that would happen, we'll name him Methuselah. <laughs> That's not in my notes. It just came to me. I mean, you're right. I'm, I'm serious. Okay. Anyway, not to distract anybody else. Enoch, <laughs> Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, there seems to be like a shift here. I don't think it's just a timeline. But after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Is that what your Bibles say? Well, what could that mean? He didn't die. God just snatched him up. I don't know if Enoch knew it was coming or not. But he was just walking home, walking with God, and God said, well, well you're going to walk right on in there. <laughs> wow. We know from the book of Jude, this man was a preacher of righteousness. He was a prophet. He preached a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. But we also know, go back to Hebrews, that he's the next guy in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We find out that Enoch, by faith, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Oh, he's a man of faith. He's a prophet of righteousness. He believed God. By faith, Enoch was taken away so he did not see death and was not found. It's funny. That means somebody was looking for him, you know, missing person, and you're not going to find him. Because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible. Can I hear you say impossible? It's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he, God, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Enoch was a great man of faith. Now, I don't know if you're paying attention, but we jumped a lot of generations from the time we, you know, went from Abel to Enoch. But here's another one, the next one that the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of Hebrews to record. 
He was a man of faith. He really pleased God. He pleased God so much because he believed in who he is that God just took him. We're in the middle of Rosh Hashanah right now. I want to be a man of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Rosh Hashanah ends on Sunday. I hope I get to preach two sermons on Sunday. I hope 10,000 people get saved here and on the internet and that God just says, and he was not. We took him. We raptured them. The ones that truly believe in Jesus Christ. The ones that please God by believing in his son. Not that we are perfect. He is perfect. In him we are righteous. And there will be a day. Boom. Boom. You say, you don't believe it. I believe it more now than I've ever believed it. Why? Woo! I'll get to that in a few moments. But like, you got that from Enoch? You bet I got that from Enoch. He's the first type of a rapture. Can I hear it, amen? I didn't make it up. God wanted us to know that way back then and reminds us of it in Hebrews chapter 11. Hey, while we're there, look at the next guy on the list. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah. Can I hear you say Noah? Do you see how I'm proceeding through about 2,000 years of history here? It's amazing. If you just follow the Bible, like, that's a great outline, by the way. I should just pay attention to Hebrews 11, which I did. Okay, by faith, Noah. Noah again. Can I hear you say Noah? Being divinely warned. Wow, you mean God will tell us stuff ahead of time? You bet he will. You have a Bible to tell you stuff ahead of time. Nobody here should be shocked at what's going on in our world today. You should not be saying, I don't know what's going on. You should know we have been divinely warned. Being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Now, technically for him, it never rained. But judgment's coming. I mean, judgment's going to wipe out the world. You understand that's in our future for the world. That by faith, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, moved with godly fear, reference, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Took him over 100 years, by the way, 100 years. Prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. You know, God showed up and said, hey, no, I got a project for you. Yeah, what? Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7. Book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7. You know, the video told us how here's this good world that God gave to us. We just messed it up and messed it up and messed it up. And by the time you get to chapter 6, I mean, it's such a mess. All kinds of evil. Verse 7, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created before from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the earth, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace. Can I hear you say grace? It's the first time in your Bible right there. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Um, really, if you study this out, there probably was close to as many people alive then as there are today on planet Earth. It was crazy. It was crazy. When you do all the math, scientists have looked at all this stuff, and I believe by faith and by reason, God had to take it out. You say, why? So that the do-over with one man of righteousness, with one family, that we can finally get to Jesus Christ, you know, eventually the seed born of the woman. But when you got all this demonic stuff going on sexually and all this stuff being born and all that, I mean, it's all in there. It's all in there. If we don't wipe it out and start with the one man of faith, well, then none of us would be here. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. He was blameless. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was 
also, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. If you're just reading along in your Bibles, if you're just reading along in English, okay. How big? Well, those dimensions are given in the rest of the chapter. But if you're fluent in Hebrew and you're reading along and you're coming down here and God's saying, okay, you need to make this ark. I'm going to destroy the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Well, you mean like tar, right? Like oil, inside and outside wood. You're going to waterproof it. Well, that's true. But the word used there for pitch, listen, kofer, 71 times in the Bible, that word is used for atonement. Atonement. Eight times, that word is used for ransom. Two times, that word is used for sanctification. Seven times, that word is used for purge. Four times, that word is used for reconciliation. Three times, that word is used for forgiveness. One time, that word is used for tar or pitch. Now, if you're a Bible student, if you're doing a word study, you're going like, what? And it was covered inside and outside with tar, pitch. Matter of fact, Rockefeller, when he saw that word way back in the day, he thought there must be oil in the Middle East. That is true. And he started drilling because of that verse in the Bible. Woo, you can get rich off a verse. But he should have dug down a little bit and realize that that word, yes, it means waterproof. Yes, it means tar. But it means atonement. It means reconciliation. It means forgiveness. It means I'm going to save you inside and out. Well, what's that mean? Get in the boat. Get into Christ. Get on the ark. Because it's coming. He's atonement. He's forgiveness. He will purge it. He paid the price. He is salvation. Matter of fact, we could say good ship salvation. Jesus Christ, because the rest is all going to die. And men of faith, women of faith, will spend a hundred years getting ready for atonement, for salvation, for forgiveness, for redemption. In gopher wood, covered with tar inside and out. That'll look silly to the world that's trying to solve all its problems in the economy and who's going to win the election and ah! get in the ship of Jesus Christ. Get in the ark. What should we be doing? Telling other people to get in with us. He was a preacher of righteousness. He, and they just thought he was crazy. It never rained before. You crazy old man. Look at that boat the size of a football field. I believe every word of the Bible by faith. There's also a crazy scientist that built the ark over there in Kentucky. You can go see it if you want. My God, it's really big. It's really big. <laughs> I bet he used a chainsaw, though. <laughs> Didn't take him 100 years. 
It all makes sense, but it still takes faith. God to give you the faith to realize the world was judged. By the way, the same faith will realize the world is still going to be judged. And we need a Savior with pitch, atonement, salvation, forgiveness, reconciliation, Kofor. That's what we need. And men and women of faith can see that, just like Noah, while everybody else is laughing at us. Um, I've got to skip a lot of really good stuff. But if you look with me, verse 22 of chapter 6, thus Noah did, he obeyed out of faith, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. We all get to make choices, we do, we have free will. We saw that at the very beginning. And God by faith, gives, or God gives us faith that we can make the right choice concerning Jesus Christ and following him. Men and women of faith. Look at chapter seven, uh, verse 15. Finally they get to the day they went into the ark to Noah, two by two of all flesh, with, in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. God closed the door. God closed the door. When God closed the door, ain't nobody else going to get in. I don't know what it's like when, you know, there they were and they all get in and, and somehow God closed the door. Probably everybody's still laughing until it started raining. They'd never seen rain before. And it started really raining. Then the springs were opened up and water's coming up and water's coming down. Guess what? When you're treading water, you're not laughing anymore. Now you want in. It's too late. God closed the door. What's the point? Get in the ark. Be a man or woman of faith. Bring as many people as you can. I'm so thankful that he saved his family, his household. And that door's still open. That door's still open for a little bit longer. It's going to close. We go into another whole dimension. And then that door in the tribulation will be open different deal, and then that door will be closed, and God's going to bring his kingdom, and then that door gets closed, and then we're at the end of eternity. Woo! -hoo! Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You say, well, what do you think about all this stuff? It's really scary. No, no, no. Hey, listen, I'm already in the ark. I'm already in. I'm on the outside hoping again. I'm already, I'm already in. You're in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God didn't close the door yet, but I, I'm in. It's kind of like when you, you know, you're going to miss your flight or whatever, and you're running down, and you finally get on, and you get in your seat and go, oh, I'm in. <laughs> and then when they close the door, that's okay. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Guys, we're in. That's why you can read right there, God shut the door, but chapter 8, verse 1, then, uh, then God reminded, or excuse me, then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. This is when everybody's dying, everything's going under, and all the stuff at the end of chapter 7, but God remembered Noah. Listen, here's the point. If you're in, problem solved. And so I'm still concerned about all this stuff going Outside the ark, I'm still concerned. I'm still a citizen. I still need to represent. I'm still trying to get people in the ark. That's all true, but I, I'm in. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. I don't bury my head in the sand and say, well, I'm not. No, but I'm in. Now I'm concerned about everybody else that's still outside the ark. And guys, it's going to get bad. It's going to get really bad. No, tell, tell us, Pastor Bill, when it gets good. <laughs> Enoch is good. <laughs> Being in the ark is good. But watching the flood come, maybe hearing the people banging on the outside the ark, all that, that's not good.
When's it over? When it comes to rest, chapter 9, verse 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons, said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Can I hear you say fill the earth? This is really important because you'll remember chapter 1, verse 28. That's the same thing he told them in chapter 1, verse 28. So now that we have basically a new planet and a new start, a do-over, still by faith, by faith, get in the ark, the ark's landed. So, okay, Noah, this is what I want. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Is that hard to understand? Does everybody get that? I mean, when I say be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, you would think, okay, got it, got it. Uh, by the way, in chapter 9, we got the covenant, so everybody can be reminded, the rainbow and all of that. Can I hear an amen for the rainbow? You say, I don't believe the Bible. Check it out. And you say, no, no, no. I'm telling you, every time I see a rainbow, I say, my Bible's true. The world doesn't say that. I say, I think they say, what a beautiful light ref reflection, refraction, whatever. No, what a beautiful sign from God. Be a man or woman of faith. So you got this whole new do-over, very, very simple instructions, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. But then as I read on, chapter 11, that's, man, that's God's command, that's God's instruction to Noah. But by the time you get to chapter 11, I'm going to say, okay, you got man's ambition, you actually have man's disobedience. He said, fill the earth. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Literally, that's one lip. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us. Can you say let us? Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had uh, brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us. Can I hear you say let us? Build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us, can I hear you say, let us. Make a name for ourselves, second time, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God said, fill the whole earth. Let us, let us, let us just stay together. Let us, let us build together. Let us, let us. One global thing, one national thing, one worldwide thing, one worldwide government, one worldwide religion, one worldwide, let, let us, we're all going to do this together. God knew what he was saying when he said fill the earth. Everybody got together. We don't have to listen to God. Let's do this ourselves. We can, we can build this thing together, make a name for ourselves. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. Forget God. Let us, let us, let us, let us, let us. And I'm here to tell you the world is saying that today. I'm here to tell you. And you, you want to be independent? You're in trouble with the world. I'm not talking our country. I'm talking the world. Because they want a one-world government, a one-world leader, a one-world economy, a one-world... That's what it is. And anybody that says, no, I'm independent, I, I've got my king, I've got my savior, I'm on the ark, you're in trouble with the world. So what's the problem? Their lip, their language. Because God gave the command, they have their own ambition they are disobedient, and then God does the inspection, verse 5. But the Lord came down. I actually think, my interpretation, the Lord came down. I think that's Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, right there. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. They're so proud of it. And the Lord comes, you guys, you think you can do whatever you want to do. And you think that, you know, by your might and your power and one world, whatever. So God gives his correction. The Lord said, 
Indeed, the people are one. They all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us. Can I hear you say, let us? Ooh, we saw that in the creation. You've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need to go fix this, or they're going to end up right back where they were. It's not time for this yet. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, come let us go down there. Confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, he could have struck them all blind. But he did this other thing. I actually think it's kind of funny. I mean, if you really think about it. He just kept, okay, we'll just mess them up where they can't understand each other. You know how that feels, right? I don't care what language you speak, but when you go into a restaurant or get in a cab or whatever, and it's a blah, 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 and you go, I have no idea what you're saying. You're probably making fun of me. Cindy and I have actually had people stay in our house. I mean, a couple of different times. And all of a sudden, they're over in the corner. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, I know somehow they're dogging us. I just think it's funny that God said, okay, let's just mess with their computer up here and reprogram it. And everybody's going, oh, and nobody's got a clue what anybody else is saying. The Lord confused the language of all the earth. The division of languages is a fascinating subject. Modern linguists know that man did not invent language any more than man invented his circulatory or nervous system. Most modern linguists believe language is so unique that the only way they can explain it apart from God is to say that it was part of a unique evolutionary process. Language is so complex because languages exist as whole systems, not as small parts put together. Most linguists believe all languages come from one original language. So God said, let's just mess them up. Not wipe them out, just mess them up that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. See, God will still get what he intended done. And so whoever spoke, went there. And whoever went, they went there. And so they all had to go out because they couldn't understand anybody else. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Of course they did. <laughs> Brilliant, Lord. This is brilliant. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel. That's where we get Babylon. It means confusion. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Okay, we can either do it the easy way or the hard way. You guys have chosen the hard way, so you won't understand each other. Until you get to Pentecost. The amazing thing happened at Pentecost because the Holy Spirit came down and everybody started speaking in tongues, but the miracle is the tongues, but the other miracle is that everybody heard them in their own language. How'd you do that, God? No problem for God. He created language and then all the languages, and then all of a sudden he can make it to where everybody understands each other. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I'm still trying to learn English, and somehow you understand me. Watch it. I get paid to communicate. That is amazing. Because I have a hard time reading. What is that? It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Plus, have you ever been with somebody that loves the Lord, and they don't speak English? 
I mean, have you ever met somebody and you don't know their whole background, you don't know the whole thing about their race or their place or culture, but when you find out they're a believer, all of a sudden that stuff kind of disappears. Now, if you can communicate, you can fill in. But I mean, I tell you, I've been in places in Africa or down in Peru. I have no idea what they're saying, but I know they're worshiping God. I know I'm in the presence of people, where, and then all of a sudden I'm worshiping God with them. It's amazing what the Spirit of God can do Whatever color, whatever background, whatever race. See, we think, well, you got to learn all this stuff. I don't have to learn anything but Jesus in the ark. And then the guy sitting next to me in the ark, hey, how'd you get here? I love you, brother. I love you. Hold on, it's going to get scary. Yeah, but we're safe inside the ark. Are you, are you, does that make sense? But then this other thing happened. Up until the baby boomer generation, nobody has spoken the same language until this generation. And for the first time since the Tower of Babel, we speak one language, mathematics. And because of mathematics, You can communicate with anybody you want, anywhere you want, around the globe. By the way, because of the UN, they came back in 1946, I believe, and this grand idea that somebody had, one world, one government, one leader, one religion, one economy, one. Then you throw in a universal language, you know what you get? what we got. What we got. Because behind all of it, behind all of it, you've got somebody and you've got forces. And I'm telling you, we are living in that time where that one, one, let us, let us, let us. And in case you're saying, no, I got me an ark. Well, then you're the enemy. So I'm still trying to get people in the ark with me. But when I watch the world going crazy, going crazy, going crazy, and I look at my Bible, isn't it the way it's supposed to be? Just before we're out of here, get in the ark, get in the ark. And the same God that came down and took care of Babel, Babylon, will be the same God that comes down and takes care of this new world order that's all being put together. And you need to know that Enoch prophesied about that in Jude chapter 1, verse 14. What are you saying? Be a man or woman of faith. Yeah, but did you see everything going on? I'm afraid you're not seeing what's really going on. Did you know one of the biggest stories in the history of the last 30 years happened this week? you got Joel Rosenberg, you got Skip Heidzik, you got over there in Israel, you got a peace treaty that is like off the chart. You say, what does that mean? I don't know, but we should be paying attention to it. That's good for Israel, but we don't even hear a blip about that. Why? Because everybody's trying to be one world this, one religion this, and if you don't agree... Get in the ark. Get in the ark. Why? Because we're close. When? We're in the middle of Rosh Hashanah. Feast of trumpets. I think somebody might be warming up. What if you're wrong? Well, then we're just closer than we were before. I'm not naming dates or anything. I'm just saying, what do you think it's supposed to look like? Right before the flood happens. Get in the ark. You say, I'm in the ark. Okay. Then get others. To, you can use your cell phone. Get others to get in the ark with us. And uh, now, I also understand i got a civic duty. There's things I care greatly about. So different subject. But overall, men and women of faith that understand what it is to be able that understand what it is to be Enoch, that understand what it is 
to be Noah, to understand what it is when Jesus Christ comes back and confuses everything. Amen? Hey, I did it! Yes! <laughs> no, I should say the Lord did it and gave me grace. And so, if in case he doesn't come, our plan is to be in John chapter 1 this Sunday. And if he tarries, we'll be in uh, Genesis chapter 12 for the second half of Genesis as we go book by book. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight and that it's all tied together, Lord. And so I thank you we can go back and study things from thousands of years ago, but see how they should look in our lives today. I'm just grateful that the person of Jesus Christ, our atonement, our salvation, our forgiveness, Lord, our reconciliation, I'm thankful that we can get in him. And in him, Lord, safe, sealed, delivered. And pray that, Lord, you would bring others in as well. If there's anyone here, anybody listening or watching, I, I pray that you would yield to the Holy Spirit, that you would yield to that person of Jesus Christ, that you would be a man and a woman of faith, taking that first step, that first step toward Christ. Get in the ark. The rest of us, Lord, that we be witnesses out there sharing the good news, and you're taking us to a whole new world, so to speak, a whole new heaven, a whole new dimension, and I'm excited about that. And yet I pray for our country, Lord. I pray for our friends. I pray for our family. I pray for our president and leaders, our mayor here in Amarillo. I pray, Lord, and I pray that we would be a great and good testimony of someone that just keeps working by faith, waiting for that trumpet to sound. So even so, come Lord Jesus would be my prayer. Ah, Lord, it's Rosh Hashanah. Please come. It's in his name, and God's people would say... Love you guys.